What's going on? My name is Ed. This video is part two of this build, so if you want to check out part one, you'll find the link in the description down below. If you're into interesting builds and hacks and just learning about cool stuff, check out Mark Rober's channel. He's really good. That said, let's get straight into it. In part one, we took care of most of the woodworking aspects of the table itself, so now it's time to figure out how we integrate the arcade functionality. This isn't your typical YouTube unboxing video because we're cracking this sucker wide open. I probably should have tested to see if it actually worked first before doing that, but it works. The goal here was to eliminate any excess thickness for when we integrate the TV into the table, as well as to move around any components for better functionality. These downfiring speakers here fit both of those criteria, so we'll definitely be taking those off to use later. I'd actually bought these cheapo computer speakers to use in this build already, and well, they're not going to waste. Because 2 plus 2 is 4. Minus 1, that's free quick mess. Seriously though, 4 underpowered speakers are probably better than 2. This front bezel was the next thing to come off, but it looks like LG integrated the power button and infrared receiver into the frame, so we'll have to remove that and save that for later as well. I marked off where I wanted the speakers on the frame, and since I also wanted to incorporate a fan for ventilation, this was a good time to position that as well. I used a combination of different sized hole saws and my jigsaw to make the cutouts, then used my handheld router to create a recess where the screen and speakers would go so that they could be as close to the front of the frame as possible. The two remaining pieces to fit are this panel mount HDMI pass-through and the power button IR receiver that we took from the TV earlier. The HDMI pass-through was easy enough to fit using a hole saw, but the weird shape of the TV button housing was a different story. I used my router to create a recess in the back, similar to what I had done for the speakers and TV. Then it was time to flex my surgically precise cutting skills. Or not, and clean up my mess with wood filler. Next up was to sand pieces down in preparation for paint, so yeah, let's skip that. I used painter's tape to cover up the button housing, then got to priming with this insert bin shellac based primer. This is almost as exciting as sanding, which I still did in between coats. Yay. For paint, I'm using this flat black spray. While I like the idea of matte black finish, it seemed like it would be pretty prone to scratching. So I followed it up with the same water-based satin top coat from General Finishes that I'd used on the table. When I was done, I had some stubborn air bubbles, so I decided to use a blowtorch to get rid of them. This worked great, and thankfully I didn't burn down my house. I didn't paint the top of the controller because I had other plans in mind. I designed this layout with some of the classic arcade games I played while growing up, and had it printed on vinyl adhesive at a local print shop. To help with the application, I applied some top coat to the plywood. Honestly, I should have done a couple more coats for extra water resistance since I needed to use the wet vinyl method to apply my print and it would have made that much easier. I prepared my solution in a spray bottle, which was just water with a tiny drop of dish soap. You then spray the solution on the vinyl as well as on the workpiece as needed. The solution makes it so you can reposition the vinyl around to line it up exactly where you want it rather than having it stick right away. When you have it placed, you then use a squeegee to work out all the excess moisture and that's pretty much it. The next step was to cut away all the holes for the buttons and joysticks, and then to trim off the excess vinyl around the edges. Which was the part I was dreading. Let's just say I'm not the kind of person you'd want performing any kind of surgery on you. I went ahead and cut off the edges with the finesse of a caveman toddler, and chipped a bunch of black paint along the way. Thankfully I had these acrylic paint pens on hand, they're basically markers that have paint inside rather than traditional ink. They definitely saved the day and worked better than I could have hoped. Still, if I were to do this again, I wouldn't have rounded over the edges with my router. This would have made the vinyl easier to trim, and the sides could be finished off with some plastic T-molding, just like a regular arcade cabinet. At least I saved some money. I then attached the bottom base to the top of the controller using pocket screws, and now it was time to hook up the buttons and controls. I got two of these two-player kits off Amazon because... 2 plus 2 is 4! 2 plus 2 is 4. The kits have everything included from the wires, the joysticks, the controller board that hooks up to your device via USB, and of course, the buttons. The switches snap into the bottom of the button and have a super satisfying click. At least to me. Not sure how anybody else in the vicinity might feel about it. The wires easily clip into the switches, and the inputs for each player all get connected to a single PCB. The only gripe I have with this kit is that the wires were way too short to do any effective cable management, but that's not a deal breaker. Oh, and the green buttons in each kit were a slightly different shade of green. I reached out to the seller and thankfully they shipped out replacements with no issues. 
From here, it was just a matter of popping in all the buttons and hooking everything up, which was simple, but it did take a while. All in all, I was super happy with how it all turned out. Next up was to get the TV mounted and electronics sorted. The screen dropped right into place in the recess I'd cut out earlier. I had a couple of different ideas for securing it, but ended up simply going with hot glue. Honestly, hot glue was the MVP here. Not only does it serve its main purpose, but it also acts as a great tool for cable management and is also a decent enough insulator as long as your application doesn't get too warm that it would melt the hot glue. I moved the TV circuit board over to the side to give me more space and reduce the thickness of the final product. I secured down the board with the MVP, then went ahead and busted out the soldering iron to reconnect the speakers. I also 3D printed some speaker grills that I'll eventually glue on later. This USB powered fan ended up being a bit overkill. It's temperature sensitive, meaning that it'll only turn on if the ambient temperature hits a certain point that you specify. I've had the table running for a while now and it hasn't turned on once. To power up the fan, I'll be hijacking power from the TV. Since the TV runs on 19 volts, I'm using the step down power converter with USB connector to bring the 19 volts down to 5 volts, which is the USB spec. With everything looking good, I set the trigger temperature to 96 degrees Fahrenheit or around 35 and a half degrees Celsius, and it never turned on again. So the fan was originally white, but I missed the outside mounting screws when I spray painted everything black. This was the perfect time to bust out the acrylic paint beds I'd used earlier on the controller and they saved the day once more. To get power into the TV area, I drilled a small hole for a wire to run through, then proceeded to mutilate the power adapter that came with the TV. This wire is plugged into the TV and eventually I hook up the other side of that wire into a new power supply. To mount the TV to the tabletop, I'm using blocks cut out of 2x4 that will act as mounting points for the TV portion to screw onto. Now it was time for the moment of truth. And thankfully it fit perfectly. Just like your fingers on the like, subscribe, and bell icons. Don't believe me? Give it a try! Everything was coming together nicely. I went ahead and attached the floor with pocket screws, in addition to the plywood supports on the ends. I'm using these simple table legs that I got off Amazon. They're super easy to install as you just screw them into the bottom of the table. I also installed these handles on the sides to give the table a bit more character. These also came from Amazon, just like pretty much everything else I got for this project. Except for this black piano hinge, which I got from Home Depot. To make sure that there was no gap between the top and bottom pieces when the table was closed, I had to cut out a recess that was the same thickness as the hinge so that there was room for it to tuck away into. I attached a scrap piece of wood to the inside of the table to act as a guide and used my handheld rudder with a flush trim bit to- oh, you can Yeah. We're not done yet though. Yeah. I sanded the areas down and tried to refinish and blend with stain and whitewash, but it just wasn't happening. With the hinge on though, it honestly kind of just blends in with a shadow. A more meticulous person might resand and refinish the whole side, but again, 50% awesome. Thankfully, the rest of the hinge install went through without any issues. Before I attached the hinge, I weighed the top and it came in at a hefty 28 pounds. That's a lot of weight that could slam down on any tiny fingers. To help with that, I initially tried out some gas struts. While they solved my main concern, they just provided too much upward force for my liking. I let that sit on the back burner for the time being and decided to finish up work on the controller. The arcade will be running on a Raspberry Pi 400, which is basically a Raspberry Pi 4 inside of a keyboard. In this case, a Spanish keyboard. Due to the ongoing shortages of Raspberry Pis, this is all I could find in stock on DigiKey, so I said, why not? Yeah, it's Spanish, but casi lo mismo? I wanted the Pi to be contained inside the controller, so I busted out my oscillating multi-tool to cut out a slot. Not sure what I was thinking making this part angled, but guess I'm just a masochist. To secure the Pi, I'm using these 3D printed mounts that I found on Thingiverse, which I'll link to in the description down below. I fitted them so that the Pi would be nice and snug, then mounted a stop block so that the I.O. ports would be flushed with the back of the controller when the Pi was fully inserted. I went ahead and repainted the back area, and I loved how everything turned out. All four players are hooked up to a four port USB hub, so only one cable needs to actually be plugged into the Pi. Technically, this controller is now a completely standalone portable arcade that I can plug into any TV, but we're not stopping there. I was feeling that space was getting a bit tight inside the table, so I decided to cut my 2x4 supports in half down the side, as they wouldn't need to be I'm that thick. After reassessing my life choices and switching into a clean pair of pants, 
I decided to make brand new supports out of some 3 quarter inch scrap material that I had on hand. I'm using this 24 volt power supply to power everything, which still required a power cable to plug into the wall. You can buy cables with bare ends on one side specifically for this purpose, but I had this long extension cord that was ready for sacrifice. These three prong cords are standard with three corresponding wires, usually in the color scheme of white for neutral, black or red for live and hot, and green for earth or ground. I cut into the cable and of course it wasn't gonna be that simple. We had the green wire, but there was no distinction between the other two. To figure out which was which, I used a multimeter with the black wire connected to the known ground and the red wire connected to one of the other unknowns. If there's no voltage registered, that's your neutral. The live wire would instead give the expected voltage. After that, it was just a matter of connecting those wires to the power supply. While this is a 24 volt power supply, it can be adjusted downwards, which is what I did as the TV only runs on 19 volts. I knew that running a power cable all the time wasn't ideal, so I 3D printed this dual battery mount for Ryobi power tool batteries that I got on Thingiverse. With the print, all that's needed is to attach these clips, which I'll have a link to in the description down below. Technically, these are 18 volt batteries, which is lower than the 19 volts the TV is rated for. There's usually a tolerance for fluctuations in electronics, and this is only around a 5% difference lower. If it was a higher voltage, that would be more risky, but the lower voltage worked fine with the TV with my testing. That being said, if you're not comfortable doing something like this, definitely don't. Even if you are, make sure you have protections in place like an inline fuse to prevent any overcurrent situations that could lead to fire. At this point, it was a matter of cutting a bunch more holes, mounting a bunch more hardware, and piecing together the wiring puzzle to get everything working. It's kind of outside the scope of what I wanted to talk about in this video, but I did make an ultra official wiring diagram on my phone. Montage time! Yeah. It's just me, and I'ma do my thing Anywhere I go or any given day It's just me, and I'ma do my thing Life a big game and I just wanna play It's just me, and I'ma do my thing Anywhere I go or any given day It's just me, and I'ma do my thing Life a big game and I just wanna play Alright Let's go Now that everything was in place, I wanted to install something to keep the lid secured closed while not in use. I ended up going with these butterfly latches made by the same company that made the side handles that I had installed earlier. I like that it's recessed so that it's less likely to be an annoyance when I try to walk around the table. After I finished the install, I filled up any gaps with steel stick epoxy putty. I'm totally not being paid to say this, but this stuff is awesome and I've used it multiple times on just this project alone. Remember my issue with the gas struts? Eventually I decided on these spring lid supports. They keep the lid from dropping, but without providing any additional upward force. While you don't get that assistance while opening up the top, you also don't have to worry about accidentally letting go and having the top try to escape. I thought I might have to install some additional weight at the bottom of the table to hold things down, but after going through rigorous tipability and careless walker testing, everything seemed fine. Right, so here it is, this is the finished table and I'm super happy with the results. So I'll just show you guys how it converts into an arcade. So just open it up with a butterfly latch, lift it up, and again, there's no danger of this thing falling on your fingers and tip over risk, very minimal. Okay, so all you need to do is take out the controller, get these bars that support the controller, pop them onto the Velcro, like so. Grab your controller and place it back on. And there you go. Super sturdy. 
So I'd put in a three-way switch to turn everything on. So first position, everything's off. Second position is just for the lights if you want, I don't know, some ambiance under your coffee table for whatever reason. So I'm just using regular Govi RGB light strips I got off Amazon. I can control it from my phone over Wi-Fi. And you don't have to control it from your phone. So I did mount um, the controls right here on the machine. So I can turn them off if I want to and change the setting. Let's say I just want a solid yellow light and there it is. To turn on the actual arcade, I just flick the switch to the third position and there it is booting up into the Raspberry Pi. So as I mentioned briefly earlier, the software I'm running uh, for this arcade, or, or really it's not just an arcade, it's a whole retro gaming setup. Uh, I'm running Batacera, which is similar to RetroPie. RetroPie is the most popular platform that people usually use for their retro gaming setups on a Raspberry Pi. But I find that Batacera actually runs games a little bit smoother. So as far as how you get the games and stuff... I can't hear you! Totally legally! I'm not going to leave you hanging. I'll just put it out straight there. If you search for Batacera and then a size of a memory card, so Batacera 128 gigabytes, you'll find what you need. So right now, this is plugged into the wall outlet, but not many people are going to have wall outlets conveniently located where they have their coffee tables. And that's what these are for. So I'm going to go ahead and unplug it. This is the cable right here. Pop in the batteries. And there we go. Working totally and completely untethered from the wall. So this is the power jack that's connected to the power supply that's plugged into the wall. So as soon as I plug that in, you can see the power light turns off. Or when it's plugged in, it's gonna be running off the power supply power or the adapter's power. As soon as I unplug it, it switches over to battery power. I'll show you how that works again. As soon as I put pop in a battery, it's on. As soon as I plug it in, then it removes power because again this thing isn't plugged in right now so another cool thing i just want to point out is that technically this is a standalone tv and this is a standalone arcade console so i can bring this technically to any tv power it up and hook it up via hdmi and then i'll play on that tv likewise this is a full tv so i'm not limited to just playing with the arcade i can also use it for other things like this fire stick so there you go my fire stick's on I can go ahead and launch YouTube and watch some videos just like that, which is pretty awesome. So yeah, so the Fire Stick is just one example. Uh, you can plug in anything that has an HDMI, for example, a game console like a Nintendo Switch or even my laptop. So let's say I'm working on my laptop on the couch. I can just open up my table, plug in my laptop via HDMI, and there you go, secondary 27 inch monitor, just like that. Thank you so much if you made it to the end of this video. Feel free to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the content. But for now, it's time to play some games.